So, okay. so we can uh, we can have a lively uh, discussion. Um, uh, first of all, I would request the panelists uh, to come here. So because uh, uh, the the protocol requires that we photograph you and make sure that you are. If you are. <laughs> so please come in. Uh, we can take one standing first. Yes. All right. Maybe a little bit closer, just a little bit. All right. And one, two, three. And one more. One, two, three. Thank you. Uh, panelists, please have a seat here on the podium. All right. Uh, well, I just want to make sure you are in the right place. This is a session on equitable climate finance uh, uh, and how can civil society promote transparency, accountability, and participation. We call it in short TAP. PFP. So I think that's that's the focus. Um, um, we have uh, a remarkable panel uh, which brings uh, diverse points of view. Uh, our first uh, uh, speaker, and I think uh, if uh, we can have the my slide presentation started, uh, I can I can introduce the panelist. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, the objective of our session. Uh, we are hoping to share with you panelists views on two subjects first is the challenges and status of climate finance in asia pacific and the second uh, is how can civil society organizations engage to help improve the transparency accountability and participation and secondly reduce leakages due to waste corruption and fraud. So the two keywords uh, that I would like you to take away is the TAP and the WFC. Now TAP sounds like dancing, but I think this is much more, uh, uh, even as more intense than dancing. So next slide, please. And uh, if you can press return uh, so that we have the first speaker uh, is uh, going to be Lara. Uh, Lara is representing the youth on this panel, and she is a student at Monash University in Australia. She has worked in the uh, climate uh, finance and education area in project management. She was uh, she's doing her master's in environment and sustainability at Monash University. Prior to that, uh, uh, she has worked. Uh, in the Philippine Department of Education, Asia Foundation, and the Asian Development Bank. I can't believe she has already done all of that in, uh, in her young life. Uh, but she has these experiences with her and using those, she'll be talking about uh, the, her reflections on the need and uh, the, some good practices for youth engagement in the climate finance world. Uh, our next speaker, uh, will be Mr. Sunil Acharya. Raise your hands. Uh, he will be, uh, he, he is representing the Oxfam in Asia. He is a regional policy and campaigns director and coordinator for Oxfam in Asia. He has extensive experience in research, policy analysis, and OKC and campaign on issues related to climate, climate change, inequality, and sustainable development. He supports development and implementation of Oxfam's climate advocacy initiatives in South and Southeast Asia with a specific focus on climate finance and just energy transition. I think um, he will be sharing his perspectives and uh, from this deep uh, background and experience uh, he has working on this, the one of the, the most important issue in, in, in our times. Our uh, next speaker, uh, is uh, Noel, uh, and 
She is the Chief of Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management Thematic Group. Uh, and she is also the Director for Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management Division. I suppose uh, the new operating model that will change recently. Nevertheless, she has lifelong experience and fashion in this uh, subject, so we are very honored to have her uh, as part of the panel. Uh, our fourth uh, speaker is Nadi Shani. Uh, Nadi is from uh, Sri Lanka. She is the executive director of uh, the Transparency International uh, Sri Lanka. And uh, she uh, works with citizens, public officials, politicians, and private sector in developing practices and systems that increase enhance uh, tax transparency, accountability, and participation uh, to prevent leakages and to combat corruption. Uh, she is an attorney at law. And uh, she has been involved in project implementation and advocacy prior to joining the Transparency International with uh, uh, humanitarian development uh, topics. This is our panel. Uh, we are going to uh, uh, do something uh, different if you have been attending the sessions. Uh, we feel that uh, having the panelists sit here all the time blocks your view of the screen. So I'll be requesting uh, the panelists uh, to. Uh, uh, at this point, move to the front chairs, and only the speaker who is uh, going to be making the presentation will come to the podium and will make the presentation. This way, you'll be able to see the presentation which has been put together by them with a lot of hard work and input. Uh, briefly, uh, to introduce myself, I am the Chief Technical Advisor uh, uh, at Partnership for Transparency Fund, which is located in Washington, D.C., I have uh, lifelong experience in development, uh, various aspects of it, and now uh, I'm passionate uh, about uh, the governance and anti-corruption and civic engagement uh, matters. Uh, in full uh, disclosure, I uh, uh, am a former uh, World Bank uh, official, uh, worked for uh, many, many years at the World Bank, and have also worked with the Asian Development Bank for many years, uh, but uh, now I feel uh, liberated not to follow the party lines and talk uh, as a civil society. I have been a civil society activist now for uh, 15 years. Uh, so the World Bank uh, is now a distant memory uh, in that regard. So thank you so much uh, for being here. And our uh, first uh, presentation uh, and presenter will be Lara. So we this, uh, this is all about the future. Thank you, Lara. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to represent the diversity population in Asia and the Pacific. So as we, okay. all right. So as we present or as we attend the last meeting or for the annual meeting or the last day for the annual meeting, I sure I'm sure that you have already heard multiple times how climate change is seeding our future. Um, the failure to act now will have catastrophic impact on the quality of life in the future. However, the impacts of climate change can be felt right now, especially as I come from the Philippines. Climate change has already stolen our past and seeded our present. The youth that you encounter now in your everyday life, they never knew, we never knew life before climate change. Climate change has been our reality since we were born. It has been part of our lives. Killing our friends and families, driving, driving us to poverty, sparking resource driven conflict and war, forcing us to move away from our homes, our roots, affecting our education, health, and different aspects of our lives. But above all, as a young person, it worsens our vulnerability. As you know, as a youth, this life stage is very critical for us as we mature and transition in society. We're figuring out our role in society, and at this stage, we're building our foundation on how we can fulfill those rules. So we need urgent action now, so that the climate change will stop sealing what it has already sold for us. And we are worried about climate change, and we use that emotion, generate that emotion to drive climate action. I'm sure you're already familiar with the grill on the screen, and we have seen young people on the streets or in social media calling for action. 
But this is only if this is not only what we can do. We can do beyond that. We are more than just climate activists. We contribute to climate action across different sectors, different industries, and different roles. And there is huge potential working with young people, as there are more than 2 billion young people in Asia and the Pacific alone. 50% of the population of young people of the world are in Asia and the Pacific. And aside from that, there's a um, trend on the aging population of the region. So we must look with our young people to design and shape our society. Aside from that, there's benefit to engaging with young people right now, invest in young people right now, because it would have a lasting effect for ourselves as we contribute to society. Beyond the numbers, we need to engage with young people because some of us are already engaged. We just need to amplify our voices. And now let's look at how to meaningfully engage young people. So by definition, um, it's not enough that young people are present in our programs, that there is a youth beneficiary. That is not enough for meaningful youth engagement. Young people should be engaged throughout the program life cycle. In one of the CSP sessions, I think it was yesterday, um, they talk about co-creation. So it's not a unique concept to young people. It's also just part of engaging with civil society, co-creating with young people. Youth as the recipient and creators working with adults for the development outcome. So drawing on my experience working with and for young people, um, especially with my work um, as a youth consultant for Creative Youth for Asia, and a program manager for the Benefit Department of Education, I would like to propose the following strategies on working with you. I think the slide was not updated. <laughs> this was not what I gave earlier, but on the way, okay. Let me just show this so that you'll remember that we are beyond the activists. Okay, so first would be, um, you need to look at how or where young people stand in your organization. I'm sure that there are some cases building that needs to be done. Um, some initial projects to prove the, the theory of concept by, by that, but evidence is already there. So it's not a question if we should engage young people. It's a question of how does meaningful youth engagement looks like for your, for your organization. And of course, in this process, it should be a youth-driven consultation. So later on, I think the young people will present um, the agenda, youth agenda, the president, NASA. And I hope that the it is not just symbolic, it's not a symbolic activity, but the senior management actually look at it and consider um, each suggestion from young people. So the first strategy would be to create intergenerational teams. We don't want to work in silos, we don't want to work alone, we want to work with adults because we also value the wisdom and experience of adults. So we want to bring in that youth perspectives to solve um, climate challenges with adults. And the second one would be to um, train adults on meaningful youth engagement or staff on meaningful youth engagement. This training could build advocacy within an organization and um, avoid ageism and tokenistic approach to, towards youth engagement. Because youth engagement is beyond taking a box to make a project inclusive and participatory. Third, we need to engage with the civil society organization and working with young people. So in the climate space, most of the organizations are very young and they don't even have a legal document. But it doesn't mean that they don't exist or that their um, actions are not valid. So what we can do so that they can access climate finance would be to work with civil society organizations then that establish youth portfolio and channel those finance to them, and then they can work with young people so that we can um, include young people to the conversation, even though they don't have the legal documents per se. The fourth group would be to conduct a vulnerability assessment and stakeholder mapping to reach diverse youth populations. So, this is very important because, uh, as I stand out to represent young people, I don't really represent all of the young people. Because they're not homogeneous, similar with adults. Youth has different drivers and barriers to participate in climate finance. So a youth to then vulnerability assessment and stakeholder mapping will ensure uh, our understanding of young people, their drivers and barriers, so we can co-create interventions with them. Lastly, my suggestion would be to compensate young people for their work. Volunteerism is good. We can see that passion in our group. However, it could it wouldn't help them to continue with their work. Because as young people, we also need to address our basic needs. 
we have our basic needs and our families. By paying them, it also reduces the barriers for youth belonging to vulnerable groups. Nonetheless, we're not asking for special treatment. It's just a just compensation. compensation. It's a basic concept in these jobs. So overall, again, the strategies would be first, to look at where young people stand in your organization. Second is to create intergenerational teams. Third, to enhance knowledge and skills of staff on NYE. Third would be to engage with CSOs working with young people. Fourth, to conduct a vulnerability assessment and stakeholder mapping to reach diverse youth population. And lastly, to compensate young people for their work. So as I end, and just like the quote, what President Mas always says, the battle against climate change will be won or lost in Asia and the Pacific. And this battle can only be won with young people as a value for them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lara, for that presentation and a very uh, passionate appeal that uh, your future is at stake as well as present uh, is being stolen. So I think we all need to be uh, mindful to prevent that theft. I think as uh, you think about uh, our own families and uh, the children and the grandchildren and the future for all of them. Uh, your strategies uh, for meaningful youth engagement uh, resonate very well with me. And uh, I can uh, certainly recommend that we all keep take that as the key away, key takeaway from uh, your presentation. Uh, next, I would like to invite Sonil to make a presentation. He will talk about the gaps between what is needed and what is being delivered in climate finance and the gap between what is being delivered and what is required. So think for a moment, what is needed and what is being delivered? And what is being delivered and what is required? And those gaps are matter a lot. So as he makes his presentation, please connect it to those gaps because that is what we hope that can be closed. Uh, which our next speaker from ADB will I'm sure focus on closing those gaps. So there you are. Thank you, Binay. Uh, Oxfam in Asia is very pleased to be coordinating this session with partnership for transparency funds. And we thank you for the opportunity. So uh, we heard from Lada, that uh, you know the situation we are in is because of the fact that there's no participation, inclusion, and ownership of people of, of the segment of uh, society who are required uh, you know, doing so. So one of the key areas uh, of work that CSOs do to promote transparency and accountability of climate finance is to track and analyze the quantity and quality of those flows against the commitments that have been made. So we benchmark this against uh, five principles. Uh, the principles of transparency, which means there's um, you know, enough information about how the when public finance is mobilized. Uh, the another principle is responsiveness. That means that is responsive to the needs of people. The other principle is ownership, that's it's owned by people for whom it is being delivered. And uh, the participation, uh, which uh, Lara very, uh, you know, eloquently articulated, and then equity. And we want to see that the mobilization of climate finance, not only address climate crisis, but also upholds social and uh, economic inequalities in, in, in the present uh, world with that. Face. So uh, let me start uh, with the reminder of next slide, please, of the global climate finance needs. Can I go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Of course. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we all know that the international public climate finance provides an essential support to the communities and countries on the front lines of climate change to do, deal with impacts. However, as the developed countries fail to meet their own goals, 
the finance required by developing countries continue to rise. We know the developed countries back in 2009 made that promise to meet 100 billion uh, US dollar per year uh, to support uh, developing countries. And they hear from that in 2015 uh, in Paris Agreement. But as of now, we've not seen that being met. And look at the figures of needs. And these are just the, uh, you know, uh, the projections of what would be required based on some uh, assumptions. And uh, if you look into some statistics, so by 2050, for adaptation, developing countries will require between 315 to 516 billion dollars. And for loss and damage, to address loss and damage, the developing countries, are, uh, you know, will require between one to 1.8 trillion by 2015. So 2018. So that's 2050 again, sorry. Uh, these figures don't include the cost of mitigation, which are again in the tune of trillions. So the inaction and delay make this cost rise, and uh, that was exemplified by the, uh, the synthesis report of the IPCC that was released recently, which says that we are not on track to meet the 1.5 degree uh, temperature limit that was set by the Paris Agreement. And also the world is failing short to now you know, overcome the unavoidable impacts of climate change. So that's the situation we are into. Uh, let's also I can do it myself. So let's now look at what is, what climate finance is needed for Asia. So recently, Oxfam did an analysis of uh, 18 countries across Asia to look into how climate finance uh, is being mobilized into this, these countries from uh, both uh, bilateral and multilateral donors. And we came up with this figure that these countries require a total of 11.8 trillion US dollar uh, by 2030, for until 2030. So that's uh, that's the, the figure, that's the costed needs, uh, you know, that we came up with based on uh, the, the provided information from the countries. So that cost comes down to 3.2 trillion when we discount China, which has huge cost, but uh, the figure is still huge. So uh, just to let you know that, that again, not the, the exact figures, but uh, you know, the, uh, the figures based on the information provided by the countries and many countries have not been able to articulate their needs on adaptation and loss and damage. For example, Sri Lanka and the NDC said that though their priority would be addressing uh, impacts and addressing loss and damage, they were not able to quantify uh, their needs. So th uh, that means that the needs are much more higher. So uh, then let's see what is being delivered to Asia. So uh, over the period uh, from 2013 to 2020 that we're looking to, a total of 113 billion in climate finance has been committed to the Asian, uh, Asian countries that we looked into. Those were uh, the uh, eight Southeast Asian countries and 10 uh, Southeast Asian countries, uh, including Timor Leste. So this finance came from both uh, uh, bilateral and multilateral sources, average is just uh, about uh, 14 billion per year. And if you look at the time series, there's just about 8.6% uptick uh, over the years. Uh, and compare that again to the needs, which is really high. So the difference between the costed needs and the public plan finance that has been mobilized is stark. Uh, look at uh, you know, this is just a visual representation of what is uh, uh, you know need what's need based on the uh, you know cost we've come, come up with versus what climate uh, finance has been mobilized from public sources. So let's now look into is this funding uh, you know uh, uh, that is being mobilized whether it is uh, you know uh, in the form that is required or is it fit for purpose for the people it has been uh, supposed to be mobilized to. And we can see three problems with uh, uh, you know, the, uh, this. The first is the debt bias. Uh, you can see only about 12% of the climate finance comes in the grant forms. The 88% is in the loans and other debt instruments. And uh, more uh, you know, problematic is the fact that we calculated the grant equivalence of uh, that 113 billion that was mobilized, and it comes down to only 49 billion 
that is just 43% of what the donors supported. So um, the, the other reasoning fact is that over the years, I showed you that uh, time series, the level of concessionality is decreasing, which means the loans are increasing and grants are decreasing, which adds to the death burden of you know, the countries uh, in our part of the world. Uh, and we also have the figures that uh, the Asian countries are already forced to spend 16 times more in debt servicing than to climate change adaptation investments. The other bias is the mitigation bias. We know that uh, the developing countries need more uh, adaptation finance and there's this uh, you know, uh, agreement that uh, the, there should be a balance between mitigation and adaptation. But we see that uh, only adaptation is only one third of uh, you know, the total of our climate finance mobilized. Then we also uh, have uh, uh, the third problem, which is the blindness to inclusion and community devices, which was also uh, exemplified by Lara. So we looked into uh, the fact that of the total uh, climate finance that has been mobilized to these Asian countries, 38% is not even screened for gender sensitivity. That's, I think, is a huge number again. And we also try to make an estimate of how much of that finance can be termed locally led. It is very difficult to access, you know, how much of the money is going down to the community level and how much of that is being mobilized based on the needs and voices and, uh, you know, interest of those people. And it turns out that only 0.5% can be termed is locally led finance. So now let's uh, go into uh, looking into a Bit of a closer look into ADB financing. Uh, Ecologists, I'm, you know, giving you many different numbers, which is uh, I know it's difficult to digest, but uh, you can also look into our report uh, after um, you know uh, this session. So, looking into the um, ADB, uh, ADB is the largest single uh, multilateral provider of climate finance in Asia. So it committed 24.6 billion between 2013 to 2020, which was an annual average of. 3.1 billion US dollar. So, but again, the bank's claim portfolio is overwhelmingly dominated by debt instruments, uh, including in uh, the financing it does for adaptation. So, non concessional debt instruments uh, dominate the portfolio, constituting 82% of its uh, financing. Concessional debt instruments make just 12% uh, in contrast, whereas just 3% is uh, in grants and 3%, uh, the remaining 3% is delivered to non-concessional equity investments. And uh, to let you know, it is uh, the grant financing is less than any other uh, you know, multilateral development bank, including the World Bank we looked into is the cases. So, and again, uh, the mitigation and adaptation uh, uh, breakdown, 77% of uh, the ADB financing was for mitigation, where it's only 23% for adaptation. So I'll come back to uh, you know, what uh, ADB can do better uh, in my second intervention, uh, but for now, uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you very much, Sunil, for uh, really uh driving the message that uh, what uh, is uh, being delivered uh, is only a fraction of what is needed. Uh, imagine against need of more than a trillion dollar, uh, what is being delivered is 10 to 15 billion a year. That is mind boggling. At this rate, I don't know how many generations we will need. Uh, the, the, the second is, uh, whereas there is a need for much more transitionality, in adaptation and mitigation, uh, we are not seeing it. What is coming and what is being talked about is more debt, which on the top of the debt crisis, which is affecting many of the developed, uh, developing countries uh, is uh, a scary prospect. The third is that uh, the money uh, mostly is uh, going for uh, adaptation, not for so much for mitigation. For mitigation, or the other way around, here. going for mitigation, not for adaptation. And so, um, adaptation is investing in the future, and that's what. Uh, so, we would like to now invite uh, Noel to uh, 
uh, she has uh, looked at these uh, these uh, uh, issues uh, deeply and is uh, spending uh, and her team led by her uh, is spending an enormous amount of time actually doing something about it. And that is a different perspective I know from experience than an activist perspective where we are basically are going for something not to actually have to face the, uh, the trade-offs involved in the real life. So uh, I would like to invite uh, Noel to make a presentation on how uh, in her work she sees that. And, uh, I want to say in the, the, right, the beginning that we should all appreciate, as soon as mentioned, all the work that ADB is doing in Asia Pacific region as the largest uh, provider of finance for climate. Noel, you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vinay, and uh, thank you for inviting us here, here today, today to share with you some of the work we're doing, and uh, thanks to Laura and, and Sunil. Um, I mean, I think I'll be the first to admit that the actual, we are so clear that the demands are enormous, and, uh, you know, uh, very much the, the work that the MVPs are doing is a drop in the ocean on the demands. Um, even you know when we look at the the combined MDP figures from 2021, which was in the range of about 60 billion, uh, you know the calls to triple that. We're very clear that that will just really uh, uh, achieve a, still a very small part of what needs to be done. So what I thought I'd do today is just share with you some of the work that we are doing. Um, I'll do it very quickly. I believe the slides will be shared with you. Uh, so you'll have a bit more information and um, I'm happy, I'll be here throughout the session and happy to take uh, questions um, uh, as, as you have. So just, um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to do two things because I don't want to look down our screen. I'm, I'm just so, uh, apologies if I get a little bit confused here. So, um, okay. so the, the first thing is just really, I'll, I'll just reiterate in these commitments to climate finance and where we are with that story. So um, we have in our strategy 2030, we made a target of 80 billion on climate finance between the years 2019 and 2030. And then ahead of the Glasgow COP, uh, President Massa announced an increased ambition that we would try to reach 100 billion of climate finance by 2030, with at least 34% of that focused on adaptation. And just to note, uh, Sunil, our figures are released transparently. Uh, as far as I know, they're on the website. In 2022, we did achieve 6.7 billion of climate finance. That was a substantial step up from uh, from 21 when, when we had uh, COVID, significant COVID implications. And I'm very proud to say that 38% of that finance was adaptation focused in 2022. So, so that, that, that is, uh, and that's the direction we hope to continue. Private sector climate finance makes up 12 billion of that number. But there's an expectation that that will crowd in an additional 18 to 30 billion. We also have an indicator that at least 75 percent of all ADB projects will include climate action of some kind by the year 2030. As of uh, last year, we are already uh, uh, in the range of 60 percent on our three-year rolling average and in 2022 alone, 82 percent of the projects in some way touched on the climate uh, issue. Very much with the ADB shift, the norm that you've heard about this week, if, if not earlier, that we have a very substantial increased focus on climate outcomes. And you'll see that that is a lot more emphasis on upstream, upstream engagement um, in pipeline development. One of the other aspects that we have is we have our commitment to full Paris alignment. Uh, so 100% of sovereign operations will be aligned by 2023, uh, July, and 85% of our non-sovereign operations. So moving on. Uh, two slides, because I can't see. Um, okay, so... The next question is, what are we doing in terms of raising finance? And 
just that yesterday we uh, launched what is called the Innovative Financing Facility for Climate Nations and the Pacific. Uh, it was launched here uh, yesterday afternoon and you'll see reports in the media. But this is basically a new instrument. It's the first of its kind with the MGBs where we are using a guarantee instrument provided by sovereign governments to release the scope for ADB to raise additional capital on the markets. It is really about additional loan, loan lending headroom, uh, but it does mean that it would give scope for ADB to have an increased loan portfolio. And that increase, that top up, would be dedicated time to finance. So this does obviously link with countries that have capacity for additional lending and doesn't. Uh, but so so that that's one of ADB's new instruments. And another area that we do are doing increased work in is with our private sector, as I've indicated. Uh, we have ADB financing, but very much this big intensity to leverage additional finance. And that can, our, our investments can be in the form of loans, it can be debt and equity guarantees and various kinds of technical assistance. And it cuts across all of the sectors, whether it be in infrastructure or for financial intermediaries, or any kind of concessional funding. Uh, part of the work we are doing in this space is it with climate bonds. And we have the first climate bond initiative, uh, which involves certified bonds and loans in the Asia Pacific, uh, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. Also, uh, just following on, it's nice to be able to talk about our Community Resilience Partnership Program. This is a new initiative that ABB uh, has, uh, we, we launched it at one of the earlier COPs, but really kickstarted the work last year. It is addressing the nexus of climate, poverty, and gender. And with that, we see that the youth is also an important uh, group uh, within that work. It is to, what we want to do is to support investments uh, in resilience to reach a scale and at the, main, at the same point, ensuring that no one is left behind. This is also a very important instrument to channel climate finance through investments to reach local communities. So that, that is more on the AB website as we move forward with that work. So the next part is, well, how are we using that finance to take ABB's climate action to scale within the countries. There are multiple um, efforts in this. Uh, I will talk a lot more about what we're doing in upstream support to the countries that can help shift the ABB pipeline, bring things to scale, and at the same time, find innovative solutions to address particular barriers that we are finding along the way. Within this work, it is really important that we see the need for the whole of economy and the whole of society transformation. It, it, we have to look at, there are differentiated contexts, obviously, in each of the countries, uh, the need to address what is the climate change profile. So obviously, everybody's dealing with different realities. What are the economic sectors that are the main drivers of each economy and how are they impacted? Demographics, we've heard about from, from, from Laura earlier today. Uh, some of uh, Asia is aging communities, others are pop with populations where more than 50% still under 30. So all of these are factors. And then obviously the development plans, the growth aspirations. Putting that and then looking at where is the policy context, what's being developed for climate change, where are the NDCs, how ambitious they are, have long-term strategies being developed, how do these link to the national adaptation plans, what are the green growth priorities, what are the sector policies, how do those sector policies link in with climate policies, and what are the timeframes? 
Also, what are the institutional contexts? We all know that we have climate was out there in the environment ministry. It was in a separate entity. How is that? But then in some cases, it's being brought in. It's linked closely with ministries of finance, uh, prime minister's office in various contexts. So this whole institutional context, the policy coherence, the regulatory systems are all aspects. And then really important is this question of uh, financial flows. How is climate finance flowing through government budgets? How is it being tracked? What are the systems? Uh, how are we identifying the private sector financial flows? Then the international climate finance, which uh, Sonia has demonstrated there, and what's the enabling context? In our particular efforts, we have one uh, technical assistance area which focuses on NDC, uh, NDCs, it's known as the MDC Advance. Uh, it has uh, a number of areas in, of interventions. One is on imp uh, translating NDCs into climate investment plans and projects. Um, also improving the DMC's access to finance. And there's a list of the countries that are currently being supported. And we're obviously trying to do a lot more to uh, raise the kind of finance that we have to be able to work in countries. Um, then the, the next thing is NDCs, as you know, they just cover a five-year period, but for uh, climate investment needs to be long-term at a programmatic level. And that's where we feel the need for engagement in the long-term strategies and how those promote the whole of economy transformation. It's a vital part in this whole story. And just again, to plug our ad adaptation work, uh, the NAP, uh, many countries have developed NAPs. They've been developed with support from various entities, but it's really vital that those adaptation plans are translated into um, national, in, translated into adaptation investment programs. Um, and that they, we can see the uh, priority adaptation investments in the different sectors and systems. Uh, are they bankable investments? And how do we link them uh, to mobilize financing for climate adaptation, for the climate adaptation? Uh, we started an initiative of supporting a number of countries. Again, they're listed on the slide um, last year. And within that, one of the things we do is we bring together uh, government agencies, but also rep representations from civil society in that process uh, to, to, to work on particularly agricultural um, uh, ad adaptation actions. The last area uh, I'm just going to touch on today is on the question of just transition. Uh, we did engage with you a little uh, earlier the week on the question of just transition in relation, relation to ETM, and that is one of the dimensions that we're working on. But when we look at uh, the ETM context that's often at the asset level or maybe a community or dis district level, and really just to highlight that, that our approach to just transition that, that we're taking, um, we have to obviously build, you know, it takes time to build our team and uh, ensure we have the right kind of financing. But we see that it's vital to put in place national frameworks, uh, also at some national level, and also at the regional engagement as to how we can meaningfully address uh, this uh, major uh, transition and to ensure that, that no one is left behind in that process. So I'll, I'll wrap it up there and uh, thank you very much and I'll, I'll be here for questions. Thank you, Noel, uh, for uh, that uh, presentation. Uh, I would like uh, to, uh, to uh, comment for your attention, particularly this uh, new uh, uh, innovative uh, I, I, IF cap that has just been launched. Uh, it seems an extremely promising uh, initiative and one of the first uh, of its kind, uh, because this is what uh, other multilateral developments will follow. Uh, and that's what uh, the shareholders are pushing. Uh, the multilateral development banks to do. So I think uh, that's what uh, <laughs> being taken deeper into. Uh, the other area which uh, caught my eye and I would uh, uh, explain why is, is the Community Resilience <laughs> Partnership Program. I think uh, it, it caught uh, my eye because many presentations made 
in the past few days have emphasized the importance of involving the people and the community in, in the climate action program. When they understand what is being done, why it is being done, where it is being done, then it becomes sustainable and it is effectively implemented. So this, uh, this uh, the ADB having such an initiative in its uh, portfolio of uh, things they do is a commendable uh, thing to have and uh, more of that is needed. Uh, now we are going to shift uh, the gear a little bit. As you all know, the impact from all this money we are talking about will only come if this money is efficiently spent for the purpose for which it is being programmed. The reality, as we know, not only in developing countries, but in developed countries, is that public spending, particularly public spending in crises such as the COVID crisis has shown us, is subject to leakages. The amount of leakages varies, but it happens in every single country. It so happens in the country where I live and pay taxes. The leakages are in hundreds of billions of dollars. This is I'm talking about United States. And these leakages are perpetrated not by just in public spending, but also private sector getting greedy and for defrauding the government. So we are going to talk now about, about this uncomfortable element of development work. How do you detect and prevent these leakages, which is a reality? And this is similar to, I would tell the story I tell, like to tell of uh, pouring money in leaking buck buckets or pouring water in leaking buckets. If you think of public expenditure pro projects, public projects as leaking bu buckets, and you put more climate finance money in it, if you don't plug the leaks, what is going to happen? So that's what I would like to shift our attention. And to do this, we cannot have a more qualified, experienced, and passionate person than uh, Nadi from uh, Transparency International Sri Lanka, the brand name Transparency International, uh, as well as PTF brand name, Partnership for Transparency Fund, focuses on this uncomfortable part of the work and uh, argues about how these leaks in the leaking buckets can be detected and prevented and why it is important that everything is done to prevent these leaks, although they can never be totally stopped. But there is room to do a little bit better than what is currently being done. And that's the space we want to put our messages on. First, Nadi, over to Fall backwards. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rene, for that introduction. And I am very grateful to the partnership, the Transparency Fund, and to ADB for giving this opportunity for me to come all the way from Sri Lanka and to be present here and to discuss. Uh, this important uh, topic. So like Vinay said from the previous speakers, I think everyone present here uh, would be convinced about the importance and the critical nature of having adequate uh, and uh, adequate climate financing and be, being uh, disseminated in an equitable way about the role of you and all of this. So I want to bring in a different dimension. Um, now we know that the ADB needs to, we have to will partner with the government of the respective nation. What if, what if there is sheer lack of transparency and accountability within that government in the way they govern that country? What if that government 
uh, and uh, influential people in that government are guilty of, uh, of grand corruption. What if that government uh, and, the, and the country they are for uh, is engulfed in systemic corruption? And what if there is a thriving kleptocracy in that country? And even worse, what if the entire nation and its systems is in a situation of state capture? Now, just to be sure that we are all on the same page, uh, I will quickly share with you the common definitions. So corruption in simple terms is the abuse of entrusted power for personal gain. Power entrusted to you to serve the people for the benefit, use it for the benefit of the country when it is abused for your personal enrichment, that is corruption. And when I say kleptocracy, this means in simple, very simple English, it means rule by thieves. It basically means uh, the country is, uh, is in the, the grip of a group, a very powerful group. This group consists of politicians, public officials, businesses, and enablers such as accountants, lawyers, real estate owners, and often criminal gangs. That is one strong gang, and they have the power of the, within the country. They call the shots. And that's what we call a kleptocracy, and they are the kleptocrats. And when I say state capture, what I mean is one of the gravest forms of corruption that can happen in a country. That is when a country's laws, policies are also changed, brought in, taken away, simply to benefit a few who are running the country, the, the kleptocrats. So basically, this uh, state capital situation is when the country's systems are rigged. They are in the grips of that powerful group. You cannot count on the legal system to save. You cannot count on the parliament to represent you. You cannot count on the bureaucracy to, uh, to ensure that the public services go to the people. All of that is being manipulated by by the kleptocrats, that is a country in situation of state capture. So, and the reality is that a lot of the uh, countries in Asia uh, that are supported by ADP are going through this. What I'm saying is, the situation I'm saying is not part of a movie, it is a reality from where I come and from other neighboring nations, we, have, we discuss this, we see the inside, we wonder whether the collective facts are taking notes from one another. Actually they do. <laughs> Unlike us, we are so uh, backward in terms of coordination, collaboration, working together with regard to the highly corrupt white collar criminals. They are very well networked, well coordinated. They use state of the art technology. They are decades ahead in terms of the methodology and their way of acting and the speed of acting, how soon they siphon funds away from the country into through an enabling nation and into a developed nation and invest in assets. And this can happen within, uh, within a day, within minutes because of the technology. But those who need to now catch the corrupt well, we take a lot of time there. We lack resources. Our governments are not supporting us and our, our so-called independent commissions are not independent. Uh, so it's, 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 this is the situation to which billions of dollars of essential money is being now pumped with all good intentions through ADB, World Bank, IMF. I mean, we've been uh, getting this kind of support for decades. If you take Sri Lanka, we've been independent for 75 years. How many uh, projects have we had? How much of generous support from the nations and from uh, international financial institutions? How many IMF programs? But we seem to come back to square one. There is no systemic change because there is an elephant in the room and nobody wants to really deal with it because that becomes very ugly, very difficult. 
and it, uh, it may go also against the geopolitical considerations of countries, which is a, a reality which we need to, uh, which we need to accept. And, 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 and what happens there, just like Vinay said, is that this, this millions of funding uh, that has come uh, for this, for, for very noble purposes, uh, could be climate action or reduction of poverty or development or empowerment of communities, uh, have been stolen away. You, what trickles down to the needy areas, uh, very, very little. It's a shame in my country, we still have uh, villages without access to clean drinking water, without access to a washroom, like schools, without decks and chairs, uh, communities without an access road. They need to, to, to go through a waterway without an access road. They could just put pieces of wood and go on top of it. It gets toppled. Uh, lives are lost. But, but the, in the name of this project, so much of funds have come into the country over the years. So And sometimes, even in a more complex way, uh, maybe you, you won't see an AD, we would say, well, we have a lot of uh, checks and balances in our system. You can't just steal money. I understand. But in negotiating what is the project that needs to come to the country, that itself can be manipulated and is often manipulated to, uh, to, uh, to fulfill political purposes. We have we've seen mega projects in Sri Lanka in the past decade. Because they were the, that, that was the need. It was clearly a part of a political campaign. Uh, the government decided to sign projects which would make them get back in power at the next election. They were not the most needed ones. And some of these mega projects, we have an airport, we have a harbor, we have become white elephant projects. Nobody's, nobody's there. We see cows and all, you know, in the airport. And, and then it, this is a story in Sri Lanka. If you Google, you can read about it. Uh, and then how much of money has been wasted? That was not the need. So we're talking about uh, a very high level, high level of manipulation now. For, for example, when I say state capture, this means I said the parliament no longer does that role. I mean, the parliament is supposed to provide oversight on public finance. They represent us. But in our country, the president and then the cabinet, the executive can make critical decisions about even including our natural resources or agreements with nations binding us for generations without that, that document even being sent to parliament. Parliamentarians even can need to know. They say after it's signed, they say we didn't know about this. Or, you, you know, a, a, a terrible piece of legislation can be passed. Um, and, 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 and we have the parliament just lifting hands and whatever the political, their party head says, they will vote for it. They do not represent us. And the only place left for citizens has been the judiciary. Again, the, the, the kleptocrats are doing everything possible to make it difficult for the judiciary to pressurize them. And we, they are humans, we don't know at what point they will also you know, pray. So in this situation, uh, another very common part, uh, which we see a very common, it's what we call the kleptocast frame. In fact, there is one like that, uh, that was produced last year, you can uh, download and read by IRI. Uh, a very common thing that we will also see in these nations um, would be the entire uh, suppression of civic space. And you would see democratic values being attacked. You will see manipulation of mainstream media, narrative building, uh, and CSOs and activists finding it hard. They are being directly suppressed, sometimes arrested. Um, and they are, a chilling environment has created even for whistleblowers. So this is, uh, this is the situation within which, now imagine a beautifully designed ADB project comes. I mean, at the end of the day, in a disabling environment, how much can even a beautifully designed project succeed, right? It's like bringing a beautiful piece of furniture to a house that's crumbling down. So, uh, so therefore, it is essential that through this, through, through at, at every stage of this intervention by organizations such as ADB, from the time it is this, uh, this, this is discussing the country partnership strategy, or it can be the NAP, 
uh, you get the voices, the independent voices who would point out these issues. Uh, civil society organizations, civil society actors, but there is a particular group among them who are the, the, the gatekeepers or who are the ones who look at governance, human rights, democracy, anti-corruption. That is a particular group, often the threatened group. Often they are even made to look like they are terrorists, like currently if you take Sri Lanka, simply because they are the annoying lot of civil society. See, if you're, to, if you're advocating for children, for women, uh, for, against poverty, government does not have a problem with you. But when the moment you come to talk about governance, uh, corruption, uh, democratic values, uh, then they do have a problem with you. And it is that group of people that needs to be part and parcel, a central part of the entire uh, project planning process of ADB. Now, at the design stage, like I said before, it would be wonderful if the, the, the projects can be used to bring in systemic changes. So you, you, I mean, for example, we do not have a procurement law in Sri Lanka. We have a guideline, national guideline, that is often ignored. Now, I know ADB for its own project has no procurement standards. Now, why not? we in a situation, we in a process where you say you develop an open procurement platform and then you adapt it, the entire state. You adapt it in the public sector. You start here. And then you have a process for that, a phased out process. You know, you use the opportunity to build in, to bring in some systemic change. And for that, the very valuable input ideas and expertise, we have enough and more in our countries, that group of civil society, including those academia, think tanks, they are the ones that they've been going through brainstorming on what are the systemic uh, reforms that needs to be brought, how it can be brought, so they can give that rich input. And then, and then uh, with regard to uh, civil society uh, being a part and parcel of these projects to infuse transparency and accountability. For example, if they are part and parcel of your project, this type of civil society, uh, they will use the right to information law, or if there is that right, you know, to keep asking questions from the officials, from the government, from about the project. They would even advocate for a web platform where all information is there. In fact, we would say, have a press conference, announce about the project and its outcomes and all of that to the people because we do not get to hear these things. It being on your website does not mean it goes to the, 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 the eyes of the Sri Lankans. If, it's, if I'm talking about my country, you know, that, that's how it is. You're not going to be going and checking websites of IFIs. It's not, it's not going to happen. But the moment you give information you become more transparent and then uh, more, the corruption becomes a little more difficult. And, and, and then the, this civil society will be the ones who will dissect, who will give us questions, uh, who will disagree with the methodology, which is critical. Right, and and uh, they are the ones who would call out for the misuse of public resources that can happen. Now, situations of misuse of public resources is just common. It's the normal way in our countries. It's the way things are done. So uh, it's 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 so normalized that. You, that, that is why it's important that ADB ties up with these groups so that they show you that through this so-called system that is told to you, which looks good on paper, this is how, for example, the entire evaluation committee of that for that procurement, they are corrupt. They, divide, they develop specifications in such a manner that only one supplier will be able to apply. And these are common days. Things have done, right? And, and so uh, these are some examples how they how the civil society can infuse accountability, transparency, and certain other processes. Uh, they are good at getting people together to infuse processes for accountability, transparency. Here we are trying to somehow mitigate corruption, such as participatory budgeting, citizen-led monitoring of development projects, citizen oversight committees on these projects, grievance handling mechanisms, citizen scorecards, 
you know, for you, you built a community center, you built a harbor, you, you know, these things that we see ADB doing in our countries. But after that, it's not taken forward because the public sector is politicized. It's not going to, uh, we, we lose the sustainability. And that's where you bring in the, the civil, civil society to build in processes that would uh, keep the sustain the impact. So these are some examples, and I will stop there. And uh, with the earnest appeal again, that uh, maybe we, you, the ADB would think out of the box and uh, do something like uh, anti-corruption, human rights, democracy, due diligence, prior to designing uh, programs for the country and partner with this, uh, this kind of uh, civil society actors to ensure that we minimize as much as possible the leakages. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nadi. And uh, I think uh, while we are on the subject of uh, giving some ideas uh, to ADP to do better, uh, let me invite uh, Sunil uh, to share a few ideas also on uh, the uh, climate finance activity that we see. Thank you. So, yeah, I'd like to start with uh, where Nadi, uh, you know, that while we demand uh, accountability uh, from the providers of private finance, we also ensure that there is accountability uh, on behalf of the recipients as well. That is uh, obvious. Uh, but again, what I would argue is the fact that the kind of systems that have been put in place to mobilize private finance also, uh, you know, uh, makes it difficult uh, for uh, you know the recipients to be more accountable. Uh, so we should not forget that fact. So uh, many of the problems we have seen in our uh, countries is because of the fact that because of the policies and uh, you know programming that has been pushed through by donors rather than the recipient countries. So we should not for forget that fact. So while uh, we value the critical role of ADB in addressing uh, the climate finance gap or building the climate finance gap in Asia. Uh, we also uh, you know, uh, have some learnings uh, based on uh, the collaboration we've done with ADB previously, uh, in addition to the influencing work that we do. So I wanted to highlight uh, both aspects. Uh, the first is the fact that Oxfam worked together with uh, ADB in highlighting uh, how we can better promote CSO uh, participation in climate financing, especially through the Urban Climate Finance Trust Fund uh, uh, that was piloted uh, from 2017 to 2022 in uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and the Philippines. And uh, that showed that uh, you know, uh, CSOs uh, do bring value uh, because of their experience working with communities, their experience and ability to mobilize communities, uh, so that uh, you know uh, these both CSOs better know the ADB processes, but ADB is also able to prioritize the needs of the communities uh, in a better manner. Uh, we also uh, you know uh, see that uh, through the collaboration with CSOs. Uh, the CSOs can themselves appreciate this uh, enemy's, uh, you know, uh, initiative and enemy's, uh, you know, uh, the kind of impact enemy wants to create. However, uh, you know, there are certain limitations, uh, including uh, in the process that, uh, you know, enemy is very much a welcoming feedback and consultation process, but again, we are never sure whether those feedback are taken into account if they actually program. So that has been a major concern for us. And oftentimes we wonder whether being in the table in that consultative process would uh, you know, be beneficial uh, because uh, you know, our community would ask, why did you go and say our concerns are not there? So that's uh, the, the concern we have, but also uh, the ADB while engaging with uh, the CHOs uh, it has a limited uh, you know, um, modality. For example, one of the modalities is through consultancies and CSOs are not here to be consultants, right? So that's one of the limitations. 
uh, there's no window or mechanism in which uh, you know, CSUs can be resourced better uh, to collaborate with ADB, which I think is something uh, to take into account. And then uh, coming again to the fact that uh, the ADB is projecting itself as the climate bank of Asia and the Pacific, it uh, definitely needs to sit away from uh, the business as usual uh, you know, that is being, uh, you know, uh, being uh, you know, programmed or being implemented. Uh, we know that you know, no matter whatever we put the name in, innovative or whatever, pushing loans to these countries which are battered by climate crisis is nothing innovative. It's you know, pushing them more into the burden, you know, adding to the burden of, of the suffering of the people. So we call upon the ADP to you know, reflect back uh, and I know that the ADB is coming up with this climate action plan to see how we can. It's we've seen there's this commitment to uh, enhance more, uh, you know, actions or support towards adaptations, which is welcome. But if you are doing that through debt instruments, that's not going to, uh, you know, provide solutions uh, to uh, the countries and communities. So we call upon uh, the ADB to first, uh, you know, stop over-reporting our bank instruments at strength finance, which is against the principles of, uh, you know, internet strength financing uh, that we want. We also want to call upon the ADB to place more attention to addressing the systemic crisis of climate change, uh, because, um, you know, without addressing inequality, without uh, addressing uh, the problems of the current economic uh, system, we are not going to solve the climate crisis. So ADB uh, needs to, uh, you know, factor that in their programming as well. And we also call upon the ADB to cancel unfair debts uh, for its member states, which is inhibiting, you know, these countries to do more on climate action, even to provide more on public servicing. Because uh, we've shown the fact that because they are forced to, uh, it's not only ADB, but it applies to all the uh, IFIs and uh, the bilateral donors as well. The more uh, loans, the more uh, debt instrument you, uh, you know, provide, these countries are forced to, you know, put aside their resources, vital resources to debt servicing rather than to, you know, put the money in vital public services. Uh, and also for, uh, you know, uh, it is in climate impacts. And I can give examples like, uh, you know, in the aftermath of uh, the Pakistan floods last year, ADB came forward and approved 1.5 billion in loan where the country was already, you know, failing to pay their, you know, previous debts. ADB came in with <laughs> additional debts. So uh, similarly, some examples from Bangladesh where uh, uh, to build the climate and disaster resilience, ADB last year approved 250 million uh, financing, of which only 4 million was in grants. So we, uh, you know, we want to uh, see that ADB is prioritizing grant-based financing at least to deal with climate impacts. We, and we, we fully understand that uh, you know, grants are not only uh, the financing mechanism of uh, instruments to solve the climate crisis, there will be need uh, for other instruments as well, but we want to see that uh, you know the majority of the financing comes through grants, at least for these countries who are being battered by climate crisis, which they didn't cause. Uh, finally, uh, you know, I want to also talk upon um, the new initiative that ADB has come up with, the innovative financing for climate in Asia and the Pacific. So this again, uh, as ADB said, is free of that capital to uh, you know provide more loans to the tune of 15 billion over uh, the next few years, I think. So that again, uh, you know, and it says that it's also going to support adaptation programs, and we are you know, you know concerned that adding in more loans to address the impacts or uh, you know uh, for adaptation we're in uh, because adaptation programs are the evidence shows that do not often you know uh, provide the return on investment. That means, obviously, the countries will be bought more to pay back, and the communities will be devoid of the vital resources they require to safeguard their livelihoods and lives from the climate crisis. So I call upon ADB to 
reflect upon uh, you know these evidences we have seen on the ground these practical you know problems that uh, you know the communities face in a day to day basis and uh, we uh, you know it's as you've been committing more to do uh, uh, be uh, do more to support these uh, you know communities and countries uh, the yeah the modalities also should uh, be uh, you know uh, in that order thank you so much well, uh, I think we will uh, shift straight uh, to the discussion point of this uh, panel. Uh, may I invite all the panelists to please come and sit at the podium. Now there are one more presentations. So we, we you are welcome to direct your uh, comments and questions uh, to uh, to uh, the panelists. Uh, I think I, I would uh, uh, take a minute uh, to, to uh, acknowledge that. Uh, I think I, I don't want you to walk away with the impression that uh, the ADB uh, and other multilateral development like World Bank uh, do not have any systems to prevent leakages or to sanction leakages or to prevent fraud and corruption. The reality is that they do have good systems and they have worked on these for many, many years. So the issue is not that there is nothing, they, they, are, they are ignoring the problem, they're not. They do the best under the circumstances and have done a remarkably good job of uh, trying to prevent leakages. The challenge is, can they do better? And where is the possibility for improvement? And I think that is what was highlighted in Nadi's uh, uh, presentation and uh, Sunil's remarks and our own experience of PTF, that engaging with civil society to partner in the all important role of civil society, oversight roles of civil society in holding the state accountable is an area which is underutilized and underfunded by the ADB. There are policies which permit ADB to engage civil society organizations. There are programs, there are information access policy, the consultation policy, the grievance redress policy, the third party monitoring. So, and there are examples of work being done by ADB, but there is so much more room to do. And that is the plea we are making here. So let me see any questions or comments on the floor. So uh, yes, please, over there. And uh, then Sam next, go ahead. Please. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been really good. Lots of good thoughts. Yes, from week to next week. In a watchdog of the MDBs. So, okay. But may be an MDB, but colleagues on all of the other MDBs as well. And climate and energy is a real uh, important issue for us. Um, so firstly, I wanted to congratulate ADB on actually publishing the climate finance figures. I think that's brilliant. And that's something I'll certainly push an AIB to do, which they're not doing at the moment. So I think that's really good practice. And I look forward to delving into those figures later. We do have some issues around how climate finance is defined by the MDB. So I know that's a common framework. And I think there's some issues in that. But I'll leave that for another time. Um, I had some questions around... Uh, climate change action plan and the Paris alignment framework in particular. I know we're coming up to the deadline for Paris alignment 1st of July, um, and I know there's a guidance note, but as a society, we haven't actually seen any of this, and I know the climate change action plan um, is delayed, which is um, a little bit disappointing because there's lots of new programs being launched, but the climate change action plan is obviously what we wanted to see a lot into detail, and as soon as we will really you know, that there's language then like, you know, want to see, you know, less focus on loans and, and so on and so forth, or no focus on loans at all, potentially. Um, and as a society, we, we have a lot we could contribute to here, but at the moment we, we're a little bit excluded from the process. And I know when we met at COP, and I know you had big hopes at that time to be able to launch consultation early in the year, and that's you know, it'd be delayed. Um, so I want to hear a bit more about that seat and also um, also an offer for us to help. I understand the ADB, you know, it's, it's difficulties with 
different shareholders and different views on how important climate is and how important climate finance is. And what can we civil society do to help police these blockages so we can actually move forward on these issues? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there was a question over here. Uh, and then Sam, you had a question? Yeah, please. Over here uh, in the front. In the front here. Yeah. Um, so I'm Ivan Injile from Ibon International. So my question is for Noel of ADB. I think uh, Sunil made a really strong case about the climate finance gaps of ADB. So what I would like to know is what are the efforts of the ADB uh, in addressing those gaps, especially about the need to balance uh, the mitigation, the finance going from uh, mitigation and adaptation. So good job that 38% uh, we had the third adaptation in 2022, but we would like to see 50 50. So that is the discussion that's happening in the uh, at the UNF Triple So we would like to see uh, a balance. And related to that, because I think also uh, Sunil uh, established a case that adaptation will really need more grants because the adaptation finance is facing a uh, systemic barrier especially because mitigation, it does not generate as much profits as mitigation action. So what is the effort also of uh, the ADB to uh, increase the grants uh, towards climate finance? So I, it's also a welcome, you know, it's also a welcome message to see that uh, traditional grants will also be uh, mobilized through the IFCAP, but I would like to see also what's going to be the, the balance uh, between uh, debts and uh, uh, non-debt uh, instruments through the IFCA. And finally, uh, maybe also a question of how is also the bank uh, reflecting on the fact that most climate vulnerable communities are already in debt distress. And I think uh, Sunil also made uh, uh, argue that you know, when these climate vulnerable communities are in bed with stress, a lot of their revenues are, are going towards servicing debt payments and uh, rather than towards public services, public spending, like education, health, all these um, very much needed social protection support that communities will need in the face of climate change and then uh, towards their just transition. But also because, you know, when countries uh, are being forced to service them in the form of dollars, they are, their economies are going to be oriented towards exports, no? So these are very, really carbon-intensive uh, economies. Uh, they are forced to uh, go to produce cash crops rather than produce food for their people. Um, so, yeah, those are some of my uh, questions. To looking forward to your responses. Thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, given the time check, uh, I'm going to take uh, uh, the, uh, the the questions and then Sam, and then I'll have a panel respond uh, to everything so we can bring it to close. So, Sam, you are yielding to somebody else to. Uh, okay, bye bye, please go. Uh, thank you. I just have a question for Sunil. When you look at what is need, what is needed, you know, what is still required, do you take account also all the resources of government itself and to what extent they use their, because I really think, I mean, it's critical that government itself invest in their own resiliency. So is that also factored in? Uh, because we did some work in the Philippines to tag the budget of government to see how much of the annual budget is going to adaptation and mitigation vis-a-vis -vis the total budget itself. Uh, secondly, I just want to, uh, it's, it's a comment. I, I disagree that investment in adaptation, uh, there's no return on investment. It's really the avoided damages that you also need to quantify. And that's a lot more than the actual investments based on experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Well, I think I will turn out panel, and uh, it seems uh, Noel, uh, you like to comment, and then uh, and, uh, I think that will also be sort of closing remarks and the observations you have. 
on the whole cycle that will be no at least one day. You know, thanks, Rene, and um, thanks to everybody for the questions. It's been good to be part of this discussion. Um, some of the questions I will uh, respond to. Um, Heidi is here and is better positioned to respond to some of the larger questions. Um, and so, so we'll see how best to, to cover that. Maybe I'll start with a very manageable question um, from Petra. First of all, on the personal lunch, uh, we are in the process, uh, obviously. There's a combined MDB methodology. We expect that the principles will be out within the May. Our work is fully aligned with that. We are completing staff detailed guidance discussions, and from that, we will then produce uh, guidance that will go into the public domain. Uh, it's already done in the last uh, couple of months. Um, we are currently working through a review of all of our investment pipeline, um, and uh, you know, as as this comes into report on the first of July. In terms of the climate change action plan, we've had a long uh, body of work internally to ensure that the plan is owned by all of the sectors and the regions. Uh, we will be sharing the draft with the board in mid June. And once we have consensus with the board uh, on the direction of that, we will then engage with civil society. And, and so, so we, let's expect that uh, probably the latter end of July, August, we will be doing that engagement with the PSOs and also with the DMC. So um, in terms of the timeline for that. Um, you know, in terms of the uh, uh, this whole question on um, what ADB funds, I mean, for us very much what we talk about in the upstream work, uh, this engagement to actually determine how investments originate, uh, whether uh, proceed into a, a, a concept that becomes part of ADB's uh, investment pipeline as part of the CPS. I mean, when we talk about the upstream engagement, you know, that is a, that is a critical part of, of, of that process. So, so in agreement with you on that, um, the, the question around a lot more diagnostics to really understand what are the implications of climate change, but then also some of this work around multi-hazard analysis to really understand where are the most vulnerable communities and, and what that means in terms of le legitimizing the, the investments and how those are taken forward. So, so that is all part of what we describe in our intent on upstream climate engagement and, and obviously to shift our pipeline to what would be uh, in the region of 50-50 uh, uh, on, on for climate investment in our total portfolio. I mean, the question on, uh, we committed to the 30, 34% on climate adaptation, as I've indicated, if that can be higher, uh, we, we, will, we will work in that way. I mean, what is a real priority agenda is how do we shift the emissions curve and how much is that going to cost us? Because unless we can shift that curve, to get us back on a trajectory that is 1.5 to 2.5. But if we cannot shift that mitigation number, then this adaptation number just continues to grow. You know, and, and that's a balancing factor that we have to think about as we, we make investment. The longer we wait to bring down the mitigation, the worse the adaptation challenges will be and the greater will be the loss of loss of damage and, and, and the numbers of people that are impacted. So, so, so it's a very difficult, uh, you know, balancing act. And, I, and we have to really consider that in, in all of the decisions that we make. I mean, anything that we can do right now on the whole mechanism of, of, of the earning, the phase out, these are, these are vital questions because the longer that takes, and, that, and that's the importance, I think, of the ETM as a, as a mechanism. This is about taking bold steps in some way 
to bring the emissions number down now sooner rather than, than the way. And, 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 that, and so, so, so I think this, this is the important balancing point. Um, uh, uh, maybe um, other areas, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, sorry, um, maybe do you, Heidi, do you want to raise any point on the civil society engagement because you're on this on a day on a day to day basis? I have three three points okay. to add quickly um, on the work that we're doing with civil society. Um, so the first one is on consultation. Um, in December last year, we worked with uh, Noelle and her team to hold two consultations, and we did it as a hybrid online and offline, and we invited civil society who could make it to the discussion. It was uh, uh, planning and, and early thinking on the climate action plan, and I think now there will be another session that we'll do once there's a draft to share with everyone, and that would be another consultation. So we're working closely with our climate team to scale up the capacity to do consultation and engagement. It takes a lot of time and effort, you know, to, to engage and, and hear everyone. And uh, as you see from the safeguard discussion where Bruce said that, you know, he met with so many people, it, it's, um, it's not that scale, but, uh, but it's good to have uh, key civil society groups at the discussion. So we're working to do that and we're hoping to do more. My boss just left the room, Sam, but I've been really working with him really hard and pushing for more resources uh, to, to work with civil society and that ADB will need to scale up our engagement expertise because it is, takes a lot of time and effort for staff and consultants and all that to engage with you. Uh, and, and it's a process that can take a lot of time. And we do need to have staff capacity to do that. With respect to funding for civil society, uh, we've had technical assistance over the years, and it's usually our team drafting it and our colleagues working on it to have uh, grants and what we call technical assistance to work with civil society. Um, that's something that takes a lot of staff time as well to write and proposal and get that together. Um, I know that Argo sitting there in the audience had worked extensively on the Community Resilience, and Re Resilience Partnership Funds takes a lot of time and effort and try to find the, the grant funding to support the work of civil society, which is much needed. And I think Vinay and, and uh, Nadishan talking about the transparency needs, uh, there is a need to do that. We had, we had a research in the South Asia department looking at projects and there is a, an identification in that report that said that it's a missed opportunity to work with civil society to monitor uh, some of these um, third party monitoring. So this is something we, we delved into a few years ago in Armenia, looking at school construction projects, where we wrote a technical assistance to work with civil society to help them monitor the school construction, working with parents and teachers associations. So we, we do need to do more of those. And I think Vinay is, is um, advising us and, and you know, encouraging us to do more of that. So we'll be looking into more of that um, in the work that we do in the days ahead.
to the expenses. We are into the situation that we need to uh, in time to mitigate. So you know, we now need to you know work simultaneously in everything that is mitigation, minimizing that is adaptation, and addressing that is uh, you know addressing loss of time. And we need to uh, be working simultaneously on all these uh, aspects. And finally. Uh, I would also like to, um, you know, uh, tell to ADB that we at Oxfam have been, you know, closely monitoring and looking into how uh, the MDBs can strengthen their accounting. Right? Uh, we've done that uh, previously with like the likes of uh, the World Bank, IBM, and in Oxfam in Asia, I would like to work more with you in actually, you know, helping you uh, make those accounting systems uh, more more accountable. I think we look forward to those collaborations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shumail. And Nadeep, what is yours? So, thank you um, for the inputs that are in the community. And, uh, um, so, I, I would say, um, in, in with regard to uh, the the strategy development uh, process you you mentioned in terms of defining the investment uh, when you engage in those consultations uh, to take deliberate steps intentional steps to include uh, the, the those civil society actors who might give you a different point of view. Uh, and you may have to uh, push for that. It may not come from the government. Uh, even if you ask them to bring in, uh, it, may, it may not reach to those. So, uh, and of course, you have to get access to organizations such as ours, so we can uh, do that. And I think you asked me uh, about what kind of activities do we do now. I think what I was mentioning were such examples. Uh, you were talking about civil society monitoring. So. Um, we have uh, developed a TI as well. Uh, this, this whole lack of accountability with regard to local development projects was an issue. We developed a toolkit. Uh, it's in the local languages and it tells the normal, ordinary citizens how to monitor the mini development initiatives projects in their locality. And that was actually uh, quite a hit because it was very useful. And of course, we, it came with the training and the awareness. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, you identify community leaders and you do them something like a TOT for them. And then they actually get others on board. And then, of course, the project uh, implementers are now uh, realizing that they are being watched. And, and then it, it builds in, you know, that kind of uh, checks and balances. And there are more, more examples like that, even we facilitate the use of right information. Uh, uh, which is a law in our country, there's a process, but people do not have enough awareness. So with that kind of awareness raising and the facilitation, you wanted to go up to appeals uh, by citizens just asking questions about what happened to that water project that was promised. Uh, they've got the water, they've got principles to schools, they've got access roads developed by just filing an RTI application. And what we did was to go there and this is a lot of awareness raising, a lot of uh, get, giving people the, the I understand you that you need to assert your rights and not, you're not going to get it in a package if you sit and wait. And these are tools and we stand with them in that journey. And of course, they take it on. You identify change breakers, they actually take it on from there. So these are some examples. There are many more things we do also with the public officials in terms of how they, how responsive they can be, how to digitalize their systems, how to actually uh, 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 we need to affect things like participatory budgeting, which are part of our law, but not implemented. But that actually brings it a very good level of participation and transparency. So these are some examples and happy to, uh, you know, engage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lara, you started about the project and now you, you bring us to a close. Okay, thank you. So in terms of ADB's internal evaluation, it has been proven that high performance projects within ADB is actually one of the characteristics is that it's inclusive and participatory. So there really is value in engaging with civil society, especially with young people and all of the ADB projects. So let me take this opportunity just to lobby for some of the things that young people all over the world are actually or would like to or private projects that would like to be funded. So the first one would be to invest or focus on nature-based solutions for climate change adaptation and mitigation. 
some people, especially the older generations, they would think that technology would save us. But technology is a partner, and the Earth has been saving us throughout our history. So it's about time that we give back to the Earth. The second would be to integrate green skills in the projects of ADB. So uh, ADB has a lot of infrastructure projects, especially on renewable energy. So like um, green skills or trainings and development for, especially for young people, to be able to fulfill the jobs that those opportunities or those future businesses would do. Uh, and the third one would be to consider the concept of loss and damage in terms of the debt and loans. So that's something that most young people, especially from disadvantaged communities, are, have been fighting for. In the in the call. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nala. And I would like to close the session by thanking all the team uh, at the back of the room for excellent support uh, and all the youth ambassadors here from ADB who have been uh, quietly helping make it a success. And to ADB for hosting this yeah. panel and my family yeah. finally for making such an interesting program. Thank you all. Thank you.